Okay, I'm going to get started and, and hopefully a, a few other people will join us for view the recording uh, at a later date. So this session is the last session of the day on the incubator track and it is my advice to Apache incubator uh, mentors. So just to start off with a little bit about who I am. So I'm currently an ASF board member. I'm also the VP of the Apache Incubator. Uh, six months ago, I joined uh, Instacluster and I'm the VP of training services there. Um, I'm also involved with the Incubator PMC, uh, obviously, and, and a few other PMCs as well. And I mentor several Apache projects and I've reviewed hundreds, if not thousands, of releases. I've lost count. It, it is actually probably in the thousands by now. Uh, so if you need any advice on, on making a release at Apache or advice on podlings or incubator in general, um, please reach out and contact me and I'll, I'll be happy to help. So when projects come to the ASF, they, they go through the incubator, generally. Um, it's not the only path, but the majority of them do that. And once they get accepted into the incubator, they have a few mentors. And, and usually the, you know, the number is, is three or four. Some projects have more, some have less. Um, three is sort of the minimum number that we, we want to look at. And the whole purpose of mentoring a project is that the mentor helps guides the project and helps them understand how an Apache project operates and leads them from where they are to becoming a top level project at Apache. So first off, who, who can become a, a mentor? Well, not everyone can be a mentor. That doesn't mean that you can't help out in other ways. Just because you can't officially be a mentor doesn't mean that you can't help a project out. You can do all the same tasks and, uh, and what a mentor would do, um, but you're just not officially on the mentor roster. So, you know, don't let that put you off if you want to help out with a project. So any person who is an incubator PMC member can become a mentor. And any existing ASF member can ask to join the incubator PMC and become a mentor that way. Uh, we also vote people in on the incubator PMC. Uh, so you don't have to be an ASF member to, to, to get there. Um, that's sort of the, the harder path to travel. But it certainly is possible. I, I for example, uh, got voted in on the incubator PMC before I was a, an ASF member. So it's entirely possible that you can do this. And the best way to, to do that is just get involved in the incubator, uh, vote on releases, you know, help with the documentation, help updating the website and, and things like that. Um, and if you do a little bit of that, you know, for a few months, it's very likely that you'll get voted in as a, incubator PMC member. So as a mentor, you have certain responsibilities. And generally that is to help bootstrap the project. So to get it started. So to, to set up all of the resources that the project needs at Apache. And then you start to help guide the project in the right direction and get them to understand the ASF policies that we have and guidelines. I mean, most of these things are guidelines. There's no one strict way of doing things. You can, um, many projects do things in different ways and they come up with their own ways of, of complying with, with the Apache way and, and how they understand ASF policies. So, but you need to make, the project aware of what those are and, and how they can fit in with them. 
Um, the next important thing is on helping creating and releasing software. So, you know, how you create a, re a release candidate, how you vote on that, um, what you do after you've finished voting on that, and, and, and that sort of thing. And then finally, you want to help with graduation. And so, the, you know, the project becomes a top-level project. And this can be quite a large commitment to a mentor. Um, most projects take two to three years to, to graduate. Some can take four or five. It's rare for one to do it in under a year. Uh, so you can sort of imagine over that time that a mentor may not stay with a project. So there's going to be other talks about the Apache way at this conference, uh, particularly in the, the community development track. I'm just going to give a very, very brief overview of what's on this slide. So there are, um, you know, the, the Apache way means different things to different people, and there are uh, certainly different ways of interpreting it. For example, but we're going to go with the main points here. Yeah, I, I won't get into <laughs> two different interpretations of it. So th there are, you know, four or five main things in it. Uh, first off, the ASF is a charity for the public good. They give away their software for free. So, you know, that, that, that's a given thing. The other thing is that the Apache license is a pragmatic one, and it means that anyone can take our software and use it for whatever purpose they want. Uh, you can think of it as business friendly. You can think of it as permissive. Uh, you know, both of those terms describe it quite well. Also, the Apache Software Foundation is not just about code. It's about community, and it's about collaboration within that community. It's about finding consensus on, on the way forward in, in a community. And it, it's also about diversity. Um, and that diversity can be measured on many axes. Uh, but I, the, the, the one I want to focus on here is that there's not one company that is controlling the project, but there is a, a diverse set of committers from multiple companies involved and they're all working together to, to move the project forward. We also have a concept of merit, and this is basically the more you do, the more responsibility you have. Um, and it's not just about code contributions. You know, if you contribute to documentation or tests or creating a website or creating events or holding meetups or writing blog posts, then, you know, all of those contributions contributions should be considered uh, equal and, and you know, you have just as much chance as becoming a computer on a project as someone who just works on the, on the code. Um, the other concept of the Apache way is that everything needs to be open and transparent. Everything happens in the public view. Discussions must occur on the mailing lists. And if those discussions don't occur, occur on the mailing list, then the decisions can't be made off them and any discussion should be brought back to them and to involve the wider community. And this is so just that everyone can participate. You know, some people may not work on the project full time. They may have part time jobs. They may have other commitments that stop them from doing that. And lastly, uh, but you know, not least is that projects operate by consensus. Everyone who's involved in the project needs to work together and find a way forward, even when difficult decisions need to be made. And all of these things brought together, there's, there's some important things that come out of this. And that is that the Apache way ensures that a project is, viewed, is vendor neutral and that there's not one company controlling the direction or having the majority say in, in what the project does or all the committers or PMC members come from a single entity um, that can impact on the longevity of a project and means that it may not survive in the long term.
So the, those two things, the vendor neutrality and the long, longevity fit together towards each other, along with the diversity of committers from different organizations. And all of those things in combination means that there is trust both from the community that, that work on the project and from the wider community and the users uh, who use the software as well. Um, this is not the only way that you can produce open source software, but it, it's a way that the ASF has come up with and that has been proven to work over you know, the, the couple of decades that we've existed. And it it's a you know a good thing basically. <laughs> so there's a lot of common issues that projects will encounter during incubation, and your mentors will have to deal with this. And I'm going to go through some of them here. Um, so these are some of the most common ones. So trying to get incubator PMC votes on releases can certainly be difficult. Um, projects can often spend a lot of time making release candidates and, and not seem to be getting anywhere. Um, when to recognize committers and where to sit the committer bar is, is a particular vexing problem, and a lot of projects have ha happened with that. Um, knowing how to have conversations on list can certainly be difficult and where those conversations take place can be an issue as, as well. And there's a few other minor things here that I'll, I'll get into, but the, the um, probably the most important ones I'll talk about uh, uh, um, uh, video meetings with the project, in, in particular the PMC. Um, and mentors going missing. They're, they're, they're probably some of the more common ones that, that occur. So I'm going to go through each of these in turn and, and talk about them. But it's I want to say a few things first about this, and that is that these are just guidelines and, and probably not even guidelines. They're more just my opinions. They're certainly not ASF policy. Um, but I do have a lot of experience in the ASF. I have been mentoring projects for about 10 years. Uh, and I think I have a good idea of, you know, what works and what doesn't work. Also, projects can be different to each other. There, there is certainly not a similarity between all projects. And what may work for one project is not going to work for another one for, for a variety of reasons. Um, so certainly take these opinions with a grain of salt and, and, and think carefully about, you know, what's going to work for your particular project or for the particular issue that you, that you have. And don't be afraid to ask for advice. Often you can get people who've had a lot more experience, who have mentored, you know, dozens of projects, uh, that can help you. So please ask for advice. Um, projects can also also operate in a lot of different ways. You know, there's no one perfect way of doing something. And often there's lots of different answers to the same problem. So don't, don't you know, don't get into the trap of thinking that there's only one right way of doing things. Often there's many ways of doing something and all of them are perfectly permissible and fine and and ways to solve the problem um and there's also differing opinions on the apache way itself so um, you may get different answers from different mentors on you know what is the best way to do something or how to go forward on something and that's fine they're, they're all equally valid so with that in mind uh, i'm going to go through uh, about 10 uh, problems that, that you might run into as a mentor and my thoughts on them and, and how you may solve them. So one of the, the probably more common problems is that you'll have a vote for a release on your dev list and you'll bring it to the incubator and have a, a, a vote 
there on the general list and you don't get enough votes. Um, so there's several things that you can do here. Uh, the first thing I would say is, and I haven't listed it first there, but the first thing is ask your mentors to vote on the release. All of your mentors are incubator PMC members. All of their votes are binding votes. So if you ask them to vote, then, you know, in theory, there should be no need for any extra incubator PMC votes at all. Um, but for one reason or another, it, it does happen an extra incubator PMC votes are needed. So if they are needed, make sure that the release is easy to vote on. You know, provide clear instructions on how to compile it. Uh, try and make it as simple as possible to verify. You know, don't don't put things in there that, that makes it too complex. Now, depending on your project, that may be easy to do or it may not do. Some projects have very complex licensing, licensing requirements, include lots of third-party code, will have other issues that's going to make it hard to review a release. Um, also, when you're voting on the release on your, on your own list, have a checklist and make sure people communicate that they're following the checklist. A single email with a plus one vote in it is not very helpful. We don't know what the person has checked. We don't know anything other than they just think it's a good idea to release it. So having a checklist and, and explicitly saying what you check in every, every release, like saying there's no you know, unnecessary binary files in this. All files have AS source headers. Um, you know, I've checked all the licensing and the license and notice are fine. The signatures and hashes are fine. It, you know, it includes a license and notice file, et cetera, et cetera. Coming up with a checklist, and, and there are some that you can already copy from, um, will, will certainly make it easier for other people to vote on your releases. And, and finally, worst case, like if you, if you just can't get the votes, just ask, you know, just send a kind, a kind reminder to the incubator PMC that you need extra votes and can anyone help you out? Oh, sorry. <laughs> so another project... Another problem a project might run into is that it has too many release candidates. Um, and there's some reasons for this. My advice would be to, to ask the project to slow down and take more time and to more carefully review each of the release candidates. Um, again, checklists definitely help here. And also, if you have a checklist, don't just stop when you find an, an issue and, and vote minus one and then make a new release candidate. Go through the entire checklist so you can find that all the problems that, that are with the release and that way you'll end up with a fewer release candidates because you'll, you'll catch multiple problems at the same time. Um, again, it's a good idea to, you know, in your voting to include what was checked. Um, also mentioned, you know, the platform that you're on. Sometimes issues crop up that, you know, depend on the platform you're on. It's fairly rare, but it, it can happen. So it's a good thing to, to mention. The other thing to, to do is to document your release process and keep it up to date. If people can see what the process is and they can follow that, um, then it's going to make it much, much easier for them to to review release candidates. And it, and it also means that people are less likely to make mistakes and you're going to have less release candidates as well. Oh, sorry about that. So one of the biggest problems I've seen is that projects are not sure when to vote committers in. And some projects certainly set the committer bar far too high. I have actually seen a couple of projects that have ended up retiring precisely because they set the committer bar too high. 
And there's certainly a, a couple of top level projects at the moment that have the bar set too high and are, are struggling because of, because of that. So what you can do is, as a mentor, is try to encourage them to keep the bar low and, and you know, describe, explain why it's a good idea to, to, to have a low bar. You want people to be involved in the project. You want people to be able to contribute. You want people not to get discouraged when they you know, offer pull requests and be involved in it, but nothing happens. So a good way of doing this is discussing what it needs to be a committer in the project and actually document this. Um, so if you, you all have a common understanding about, you know, if this is the level that you need to be put in as a committer, then, then it makes it easier to, to elect people to, to, be, to be a committer. Also, make sure that you recognize all forms of contribution, uh, not just code, documentation, testing, uh, all sorts of things, whatever you need. Uh, uh, you know, organizing events, uh, writing a blog, organizing a conference, any of those things that help grow the community should be recognized. The other thing that often happens is that it's easy to recognize people who come along and suddenly contribute, you know, a large amount in a short amount of time. You often don't recognize people who commit slowly over a long period of time. So you might want to try and put some mechanisms in place to try and find those sort of people and make sure they're recognized as, as, as committers as well. Another common problem that, that I've run into is that you often, um, well, you won't see this happening, but you'll, 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 you'll get a good, under, uh, good feel for it, I guess where you can see that obviously there's something going on. Um, and then that is that the discussions are happening off list. And that's not a good thing because it means that the wider community are not involved in making the decisions and setting the direction of the project. It means you have this select group or elite group of people who decide what's happening and, and that, it can be accidental. It, it, it just may be that these people are used to operating in this way and uh, used to having face-to-face uh, -face meetings or synchronous meetings and deciding things at, at those meetings rather than operating in an asynchronous manner and in involving the entire community. So it's good to explain why this is a you know, why conversations should happen on the mailing list and why it's important. Um, and also to make sure that if anything is discussed off list uh, or discussed in a, you know, a different forum, be that instant messaging, that it's brought back to the list, um, particularly if any decisions have been made. All decisions should be made on the mailing list and not elsewhere. Um, and the great thing about the mailing list is that it's searchable, it's an archive, people can engage with it in a synchronous manner. Um, there's so many benefits to having that form of com communication rather than some of the other forms such as instant messaging. Um, instant messaging, for example, often has um, a lot of content, but not a lot of information. Most of it is just general chat. Um, so actually finding the important bits in an instant message stream, it, it can be difficult. When people write emails, they tend to think about them more. They tend to construct them more. And the information content is much higher. Um, emails also have the, 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 the advantage that they can be threaded. They have subject lines, so you can scan subject lines to see what's important to you and what's not important to you. Um, you know, emails are often, and email lists are often seen as old school, but they still have 
a lot of huge advantages that other technology hasn't been able to come up with or replace yet. Sorry, I did that wrong. <laughs> so um, another issue that may come up for mentors is, is that the PMC of a project, like discussing uh, direction of the project and, and what's going on on the private list. Uh, and that shouldn't really happen there. So if too much is going on on the private list, remind a podling what the private list is for. It's generally only for things like security issues. If there's some serious issues between people uh, that need to be resolved in a private way, or election of committers and new PMC members. And that's about it. There shouldn't be really be a lot going on on the private list. Most of the conversation should be having on the dev list. And, and that means, you know, that helps the project be open and transparent. And that's how you want an ASF project to, 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 to operate. With GitHub, in, in recent years, a lot of projects have moved away from Subversion and used to go on to use GitHub. And GitHub can be quite noisy and send lots and lots and lots of email and notifications. So sometimes this can interfere with you know natural conversations that are happening on list. So a good suggestion is to try and split that traffic up and send it to another list, like a commit list or something else along those lines. Um, this is fairly easy to set up and fairly easy to do. Um, the earlier you do it, it's, it, it's probably better. Um, but, you know, if you've got low volume commits, then it may be okay to mix that in with the dev traffic as well. So a, a trend that I've seen more in, in more recent years is a trend towards using face-to-face -face video meetings. And, and these are good for a number of reasons in that, you know, people in the community get to interact with them, with each other in, in, in a way that is more, um, I guess, personable is, is a word for it. But, you know, you, you having email-only conversation can be difficult. Uh, having a conversation with someone face-to-face, -face, even if it's over a video link, can give you a lot more information. Um, it doesn't replace a face-to-face -face conversation, but it, it can still do that. But the problem with video meetings like this is that they are synchronous. So immediately they exclude a whole lot of people. They exclude people who are not in your, the, the time zone that you've arranged for the meeting. Uh, for example, at the moment, you know, this is a, a conference and we're live. I'm actually giving this talk and it's now uh, 5.20 a.m. in the morning. I've been up all night. So this is probably not the best talk that I've ever given. So... Um, I'd like to think that I'm, you know, engaged and, and and providing information to people who are listening here, but, you know, I am a little tired, so I'm not at my best. Anyway, the, the fact is that, you know, not everyone's going to be in the same time zone. Not everyone is going to be able to make that face-to-face -face meeting because of work commitments. They may have a day job that stops them from, from attending and they only work on an Apache project, you know, outside of these hours. Um, it may be that they have other commitments, such as family or, or whatever, you know, it, 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 really, it really disadvantages a lot of people. So you need to consider that. So if, people, if a project does insist on having these sorts of meetings, um, there's a, a few things you can do. So first off, encourage the use of open platforms. Uh, not everyone can have access to some of these video meeting platforms, uh, and that can be a disadvantage as well. Make sure that everything is that is discussed is brought back to the list. It It's a good idea to have an agenda before the meeting that is sent to the list so everyone knows what is going to be discussed. 
so they can become involved if they, they if they see something that you know interests them or is important to them um and also don't make any decisions at that meeting bring everything back to the list and make the decisions uh, there uh and this way you can sort of get the advantage of those having um these these types of meetings that's still encouraging asynchronous communication so often when a project comes to the asf they already have a community um they already have a github site for example and quite often they already have a, a, a website now it's vitally important that the project management committee or the, the podlink project committee committee in the site because they haven't graduated as a top level project um, actually has control of that website. And, and quite often that is not the case when a project first comes to there. Uh, so you need to fix this, you know, reasonably quickly. Um, and th th there's the ways to encourage this. Um, you want to try and move that website to the ASF infrastructure if, it, if it's at all possible. Uh, one way of doing this is to... to uh, create a new site and then a redirection from the old site to the new site. Um, and you need the PMC to have a careful read and understand ASF trademark and branding policy. A lot of projects leave this far too late in the graduation process. Putting it just before graduation in some cases can mean that the project won't graduate and, and that's you know going to be an awful thing to happen. Uh, this has ha happened to a couple of projects, you know, that they've got to, to that point, thought they were ready to graduate, and they, they just haven't done the work in terms of the, the website and trademark and branding, um, and it means that graduation has been delayed um, by several months, and they've had to go through a, you know, the, the whole process again. So... I mentioned before that, you know, projects can take a while to graduate. In some cases, it can, you know, generally two to three years is, is the average. But in some cases, it can take four to five. If you're lucky, it can take one. But given that long period of time, mentors, um, you know, may change jobs. They may get married. They may move house, move countries, have children, all sorts of things. May happen. They may, may may even sadly pass away. That's that's happened on a couple of occasions. Um, so it's a good chance that some of your mentors may go missing during your incubating process. And there's a few ways that you can do this. Um, first off, I would actually be careful in the mentors that you select. So have a look at their track record and see what they've done in the past um, and if whether or not they've stuck with projects or not. doesn't mean that all your mentors, you know, have to have a large amount of experience or be the best possible mentors. Everyone can help out in their, in their own way and they don't have to be there 100% of the time. But, you know, having a little bit of research on to who th you think might be a good mentor for your project will certainly pay off. Um, mentors can sometimes go missing and it's just temporary. You know, they get busy at work for a few months. Um, that's not a bad thing. You shouldn't have to rely on your mentors all of the time. And if one disappears for a few months, that shouldn't be an issue. If they do go missing, and if it is longer for that, um, just ask them whether they still want to be a mentor, you know, whether they still want the responsibility of, of looking after your project. Uh, if that's not the case they can retire and there's there's no shame in that it's you know they've they've done their job they've helped you out as long as they could the situation's changed and they, they can't help any any more um so it's better in that case is is if they do retire and you get another mentor to, to help you out um if you're in real trouble and all of your mentors have disappeared or you know you've only left with one mentor then ask on the incubator mailing list for, for new mentors and and hopefully the incubator PMC will will rally together and be able to find you a, a, a couple of them. 
Um, occasionally projects, um, and, and this is generally for uh, commercial reasons or they, they think they have this artificial deadline. Um, anyway, a, a project will try and seek out early graduation. Um, a good example is there's a conference coming up and, and they want to announce that they've graduated before the conference happens. Um, and they may not actually be ready to graduate. Uh, and again, it can be a pretty demoralizing experience for the people if they go up for, for graduation, go for a graduation vote, and it's actually rejected by the incubator. Um, you know, that, that may discourage them and it may seriously delay the, when they should have actually graduated. So if this is happening um, and you see that, that the project may be trying to seek an early graduation, try and find out why they're doing that. Try and give detailed feedback on their reports so you can, you know, you can have an honest assessment of where they are and, and whether they, they're ready to graduate or no. We also have a thing called the uh, maturity model uh, for projects try and get them to fill it out. It's not compulsory, but if they go through this process of looking at that and reflecting on where they are, they may hopefully decide that they're not actually ready, ready to graduate and can see where the gaps are and, and what they need to do to, 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 to fill those in. So that is it from me. Um, I hope you've got some valuable information out of this. Uh, again, you know, these are just my opinions based on my experience at being a mentor for projects. Uh, these are certainly not policy and each project is going to be different and, and require some different handling. If you have any questions, just put them in the chat. Now, if you don't, we'll call it a day. And this is the last session of the incubator track for today. We have a, another full day of incubator sessions tomorrow. Today, the focus was on how the incubator operates. Um, tomorrow is more about stories from individual podlings. So it's a slightly different focus, but should be just as interesting. Uh, and I hope you turn up for those sessions as well.